Chapter Eleven of the Young Pretenders by Edith Henrietta Fowler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, Father and Mother in India. Now the question was whether Father and Mother in India were to become Father and Mother in England at all during Babs and Teddy's childhood. Major and Mrs. Conway were very much puzzled about it in India, and Uncle Charlie and Aunt Eleanor were very anxious in England, but the children themselves never gave it a thought. The memory even of Nana was growing faint, and the misty hopes of a good father and mother were entirely swallowed up in the glad reality of a kind uncle. "'There's only one thing I would like,' said Babs. "'I would like us and Uncle Charlie to live at Cloverdale with Giles for our nurse, and Aunt Eleanor and real nurse to stay in London for ever and ever.' But Teddy had begun to go to school, and he greatly enjoyed the companionship of other boys, and above all the games in kensington gardens in the middle of the day which one of the younger masters organized this was rather a sore point with babs because teddy never would acknowledge her in any way if she met the school out walking and it cut poor babs to the quick it's silly to nod to you argued teddy the other boys don't and they would laugh at me but i'm not their sisters said babs meekly other fellows don't meet their sisters and i don't like to meet mine said teddy who was an english schoolboy fledged on the first day of the term perhaps they haven't got no sisters muttered babs who was terribly ashamed of being in such a humiliating position of relationship teddy's going to school made it very dull for babs and uncle charlie interfered i won't have her shut up alone with that old grimston ogre he said to aunt eleanor you must get a young jolly governess i don't know the kind you want so you had better interview them yourself witheringly and this was aunt eleanor's revenge female after female arrived in answer to the advertisement and uncle charlie bravely saw them all the process he felt aged him considerably but thanks to his selection red-cheeked mary miss drew now reigned in the schoolroom and lessons became games under kindergarten administration while playtime was truly a dream of delight for Maggie Drew had half a child's heart even in her twenty-fifth year, and she was in touch with many little brothers and sisters in the nursery at home, and with all other children for their sakes. Uncle Charlie peeped into the schoolroom one morning and found Babs and her new governess enveloped in huge pinafores making clay models of all kinds of quaint animals. A lovely kind of playwork which taught Babs more natural history in an hour than all Miss Grimston's pleasant pages put together. "'Your pig is too thin. Fatten it up or mine will be ready for killing first he heard miss drew say and then peals of laughter followed him as he went downstairs she is the right sort at last he thought thankfully as he lit a cigarette please may i have another help of lemon sponge asked babs at luncheon certainly not said aunt eleanor you have had two already but i'm very hungry pleaded babs as if lemon sponge were the most substantial of all viands you are very greedy babs continued her aunt no i aren't only lemon sponge is so very melting afore you can bite it the last help i had was nothing but warm air uncle charlie laughed i don't believe you are really a greedy little girl he said kindly but i have a thought oh i loves your pots interrupted babs i will buy you a bottle of sweets for your very own and it shall be kept in the sideboard cupboard and you can have one whenever you like without asking only you must use your right judgment about it and then you can show us that you are not greedy oh charlie how ridiculous said aunt eleanor the child will be ill in no time i'm not so sure of that said her husband people of five years old should learn to use their sense and when he came in that night he brought a lovely big bottle of acid drops and babs thought the one he gave her to taste was quite the most delicious sweet i ever eated for two or three days babs was very careful it makes it so splendid and exciting not to have to ask leave every time she told teddy i's going to have a sweet announced the little girl just as lunch was over a few days afterwards and she climbed down off her chair aunt eleanor shrugged her shoulders and uncle charlie observed i don't think i should eat a sweet directly after a big dinner if i were you but of course you can if you like it's my right judge said babs flushing up and tossing her head all right said uncle charlie but babs was a long time at the cupboard door what are you doing with your pinafore asked her aunt suddenly 
i's wiping my acid drop dry exclaimed babs cause i don't think i'll eat a sweet directly after a big dinner and if i put it back in the bottle afore it's dry it'll stick to the others uncle charlie and eleanor both laughed and her uncle stooped to kiss babs before he went out you are not a greedy little girl i see he said gently i knew i wasn't only i had rather a narrow skate to-day didn't i uncle charlie she added solemnly the next mail from india brought very good news for babs and teddy father and mother in india were really coming home after all coming almost at once with nana and the babysitter to fetch the children from london and take them home again to dear old cloverdale when uncle charlie told them teddy and babs were full of delight and excitement for quite ten minutes they were at schoolroom tea which meal was generally enlivened by teddy's thrilling accounts of the perils and penalties of school life from which it would appear that he was one of the most dare-devil characters that had ever defied school discipline though in reality little conway was a model of timid propriety in the actual awe-inspiring presence of the masters will father and mother and injia take me away from school asked teddy anxiously will they take me away from you dear uncle charlie questioned babs they will arrive just in time for the holidays and take you back to spend them at cloverdale you too persisted babs holding fast his coat sleeve perhaps said uncle charlie with a tender look in his eyes i wants to show you the new chair in my doll's house what miss drew taught me to make will you excuse me she asked the governess who gave a smiling consent but uncle charlie was horrified to see a decaying bit of cheese reposing on the grand new chair he instantly seized it and threw it in the fire oh screamed babs you have killed the little darlings why did you in an agony of reproach it was a nasty bit of cheese and smelt horribly exclaimed uncle charlie amazed but it was our pet mites said babs sadly and now they is all burned kite dead never mind little one they are not nice pets for you to have and you will soon have all your splendid country pets again oh yes cried babs quickly diverted i do wonder how many of darling suits kittens will be alive and if the rabbits are quite well so the interest of their parents coming centred in the thought of cloverdale and father and mother and injia were regarded as the passports to that enchanted home one night babs had been fast asleep for quite two hours when a murmuring of voices disturbed her and she slowly opened her big brown eyes to see a most surprising sight a strange lady was leaning over her bed and by the fireplace sat nana with a crumpled bundle of white draperies on her knee oh nana shrieked babs directly her sleepy brain decided that it was not all a dream and the little girl flew out of bed brushing past the strange lady straight into nana's disengaged arm there miss babs darling said nana after a very big hug now go and kiss your mamma the strange lady was standing alone by the empty bed gazing at babs with hungry eyes come my darling she said in a rather broken voice for somehow barbara conway had never realized before that her home coming would be nothing to her little daughter compared with nana's that she was only a stranger while the nurse was a dearly loved friend babs stood still with wondering eyes she is a bit sleepy ma'am explained nana no i aren't interrupted babs gravely i are thinking bout things oh babs cried the lady won't you come to me i am your mother you know the mother out of father and mother in india asked babs drawing nearer yes darling very gently then i will kiss you said babs holding up her face and where is the other one here he is cried uncle charlie who was standing in the doorway with his brother and this is babs he added proudly as the child rushed into his arms and he lifted her up to kiss her father you is like uncle charlie said babs looking into major conway's face critically i's glad of that we're brothers you know answered her father and are you as nice as him babs asked a little anxiously nicer said uncle charlie and then they all laughed barbara conway looked rather sadly at the merry group she seemed so outside her little daughter's world and she did not know that bab's experience led the child to shrink from grown-up ladies like aunt eleanor 
but uncle charley seeing the same wistful look in his sister-in-law's brown eyes that he had tried so hard to banish from her little daughters understood and held out the child to her mother there babs he said gently you will be the happiest little girl in the whole world now father and mother and ninja have come to take care of you in england give your mother a very big kiss because she loves you so much and has wanted you all these years so dreadfully and do you want me now babs asked holding her mother's face in her two fat hands and gazing into it earnestly yes my darling much more than i can tell you and barbara conway felt as if she must break down then i's glad you've come and i will love you too and kiss you tight and hard like i do uncle charlie promised babs and her mother stayed with her whispering very tender soothing talk till babs sleepy eyes closed and when ned conway came up to look for his wife he found her with her head on babs pillow and his little daughter's rosy cheek pressed close against her mother's the next morning babs rushed into teddy's room feeling very superior did you see father and mother in india last night she asked hoping most fervently that he had not no said teddy i never woke in the night at all i did exclaimed babs proudly and i know them quite well father minds me very much of uncle charlie but mother isn't a bit like aunt eleanor teddy jumped into his clothes as quickly as time and cold fingers would permit and he and babs tore downstairs a tall gentleman ran out and caught them on the second landing and before breakfast teddy knew father and mother in india almost as well as babs did can you play cricket teddy asked his father at breakfast rather exclaimed uncle charlie why your father is a splendid cricketer old fellow and you shall be one too my boy said major conway we will practise all the holidays and with a father who was a first-class cricketer what more could any english schoolboy want mother said babs afterwards jumping on to her knee violently and putting one fat arm as far as it would reach round mrs conway's neck do you mind much about me not being pretty like aunt eleanor does oh my darling what do you mean i think you are the dearest nicest little daughter in the whole world and i would not have you one tiny bit different wouldn't you exclaimed babs amazed hadn't you rather my hair was golden or something no no her mother assured her i love you best just as you are dear i so glad murmured the child cause it makes there nothing nasty to think about just then nana came in with the baby my new sister is very funny observed babs regarding her with interest but i don't think she will ever be able to walk mother do you her feet are exactly like mole's feet they are not quite big and strong enough yet but very soon baby will run about and play with you and make up for teddy's being at school oh mother i are glad you came cause it was so dull afore when teddy went to school it won't be dull ever again for we shall be at cloverdale and you will have baby and me always to play with can you play i didn't think grown-up ladies ever could play i thought it messed their dresses mine don't matter and we will wear comfortable old ones that'll be jolly laughed babs and mother we will take uncle charlie to cloverdale too oh yes your father and uncle charlie used to play together when they were little boys and they will want to play together again now me too uncle charlie's sure to let me play with them he always does you see mother you are very fond of uncle charlie i think babs in course i am i belong to uncle charlie you know not to your father and me exclaimed her mother babs looked puzzled half to you and half to father but i think the biggest half to uncle charlie yes dear that is it you belong to us because we are your father and mother but i think you must always belong to uncle charlie too because he has been so good to you i don't think we will take aunt eleanor to cloverdale added babs and just then the baby began to cry which changed the conversation but her mother heard and understood End of chapter 11
Chapter Twelve of the Young Pretenders by Edith Henrietta Fowler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, Home Again. Daddy, Daddy! Shouted Babs, scrambling through the morning room window at Cloverdale and tearing across the lawn. Here I am. What is it? Called Major Conway from the cricket pitch where he and Teddy were having a little practice. Have you seen Dash? Mummy and me's lost him and we's rather afraid bout the new chickens no he hasn't come this way said her father stooping to kiss the dear brown little face which looked up so eagerly into his own he could not help kissing babs whenever he met her she had such splendid fat cheeks and such a merry laughing face altogether that it was irresistible how the children did love being back at cloverdale and it was far nicer now than ever before because father and mother at home were so much better and dearer and jollier than father and mother in india every single day was so happy unspoiled by the curse of best frocks or gloves or even continual cleanliness and babs was almost intoxicated with the bliss of those long summer days after her year of life in london dash hasn't come this way mummy called babs as mrs conway appeared in the distance and then she started running towards her mother with all the speed of which her short fat legs were capable then we must go and look for him in the poultry yard i'm afraid he has gone there i is afraid so too and their fear was fully realized for at the very entrance to the poultry yard lay a beautiful big chicken quite dead while dash with the innocent countenance dogs know so well how to assume sat gazing at the beauties of nature evincing a slightly bored interest in the question as to how the best white chicken could possibly have met with its death oh mommy gasped babs gazing with sorrow on the murdered fowl and it looked as if it was just going to lay a little boiled egg never mind darling but it is really very naughty of dash babs promptly made for the degenerate spaniel but dash had apparently just remembered an important engagement at the other end of the garden and hastened to fulfil it is anybody coming to lunch to-day asked babs presently yes a soldier friend of daddy's soldiers aren't quite what i used to think when i was little mummy aren't they dear why not well you see they kill fewer people and play games a good lot more than fighting i know heaps of soldiers now uncle charlie and daddy and uncle jack and the friend what is coming to-day makes four but then you don't see them in battles you know babs no said the child doubtfully but mummy i think it's nicer to play games than kill people and i are glad that uncle charlie and daddy is that sort her mother laughed i think daddy and uncle charlie are the right sort too the very rightest in the whole world said babs enthusiastically this is my little girl said major conway introducing babs to his friend just before luncheon and how many of you are there captain eardley asked her presently three and the paroquet makes four answered babs quickly and teddy goes to school but i have a governess i can do lots of sums she added proudly adding and taking away ones that is very clever of you said the gentleman it is not quite so clever as it might be she confessed candidly cause the last little girl what my governess taught could do borrowing afore she was six but though i are rather backward in my lessons i are very forward in my play teddy says after lunch mrs conway and the children went out into the garden and teddy induced his mother to bowl to him for a little but babs for some occult reason returned to the dining-room where the gentlemen were smoking run away now babs said her father daddy i s fraid i can't answered the child with a flushed face but fixed expression major conway was intensely surprised babs he exclaimed what do you mean i feels i must stay continued babs cause i want to so dreadful much her father did not care to prolong the contest or bore his friend with domestic discipline so he proposed a game of billiards and the gentleman walked off leaving babs standing in the middle of the room with crimson cheeks i am sorry you are a disobedient little girl major conway said gravely as he went out and shut the door after a few minutes deliberation babs walked slowly down to the cricket pitch and stood looking on with so solemn a face that her mother's attention was attracted has anything gone wrong babs she asked quickly something has gone wrong answered babs impressively 
"'What is it, dear?' "'Babs looked bored. "'I think it is too difficult to tell you, Mummy.' "'Oh, no, my darling. Come and sit on my knee and whisper it.' "'I think I could tell it better from here,' said Babs, looking straight up into the sky. "'Very well, dear. What is it?' "'Babs continued gazing heavenwards and observed, "'I are naughty.' "'What kind of naughtiness?' asked her mother, surprised. "'The worst what there is.' replied babs with such earnestness as befitted so serious a confession mrs conway stifled a strong desire to laugh and what is that tell me all about it disobedience to daddy continued babs becoming interested in the narrative and he is very sorry about it not a nice comforting kind of sorry but rather a stern solemn sorry oh babs and i hope you are sorry too i think i shall be soon said babs discreetly but i can't be quite sure yet well dear directly you are sure i would go and tell daddy if i were you it rained yesterday when i was out began babs irrelevantly very hard drops of rain and then she picked up her hat and walked slowly away swinging it by the elastic and talking aloud to herself to keep up her spirits it is very hot to-day and rather uncomfortable too i specs that's what makes my cheeks so thirsty i will go and dig in my garden and then i shall be quite happy but digging in her garden even did not make babs happy it keeps getting uncomfortabler she continued stopping to rest and my old things aren't growing a bit nice giving some precious radish tops a vicious smack with her spade perhaps they want water it'll be jolly watering them with my watering can but somehow even the watering-can failed to charm the water seems wetter than it generally is she said crossly stooping down to rub a big splash off her stocking and then she kicked the can right over and stood gloomily watching the wandering streams of water on the path sakes alive observed giles coming up at that moment what a mess the child be making to be sure what's the matter little missy he asked seeing her disconsolate face nothing is the matter giles said babs drawing herself up and i think you are very interfering to call my garden what a mess old giles looked at babs in amazement my conscience alive he observed you are in the tantrums to be sure and no mistake babs flushed up to the roots of her hair when people are very hot and uncomfortable giles she exclaimed and other people will keep on talking so much it makes it very very racking her brains for a suitable epithet very beastly indeed my garden wanted watering badly and in course i was obliged to tend to it and babs marched away trying to look as dignified as a fat little girl in a dirty pinafore can she went across the orchard and down the steps round the corner on to the lower lawn where major conway was sitting alone in the shade oh exclaimed babs in surprise and then stood still babs called her father come here to me babs advanced slowly she was a little in doubt as to how events would shape themselves babs said major conway very gravely have you anything to say to me babs looked up to the sky and down to the ground i have something but it is almost too hard to say now i thought it might be easier after tea it will be harder after tea try to say it now little one oh you speak just like uncle charlie then exclaimed babs brightening a little and i are sorry i was naughty daddy that is right said her father lifting her on to his knee and kissing her now i are sorry will you leave off being yes babs and you will not be disobedient any more will you no i won't and do you know i think it was you being sorry and me not what made things all so hot and uncomfortable yes that was it well i's good now daddy kite good oh here is mummy come mummy she shouted at the top of her voice i have left off being naughty and daddy has kite forgived me that's all right cried mrs conway and as she came up to him i shall soon be quite a cricketer even teddy says i am improving in my bowling we must have a match said major conway oh yes cried babs 
you and i will play mommy and teddy and then as her brother scoffed at such a girlish idea daddy i want to ask you something will you give me some little onyas for my garden some little what onyas you have big onyas in your garden and i thought i would like some little ones in mine her father and mother both laughed your garden looks rather sloppy said major conway regarding the damp plot that's the naughtiness remarked babs truthfully it made me rather over water it i think that was a pity said the major it was echoed bab solemnly there was great excitement at cloverdale when major conway's big packing cases arrived from india the relics of his sport there excited the children beyond all bounds and inspired babs with most oriental pretences the garden became a jungle and every day full of thrilling adventures with tigers elephants or bears she never went out without her little toy gun as a protection against these savage beasts and major conway was called upon to tell endless stories of the adventures he had met with in his life of sport in india i have shot three tigers this morning announced babs one day at luncheon and two of them was man-eaters you had good sport then said her mother who always entered splendidly into the children's pretenses i had what shall you do with the skins asked major conway i shall send them to the british museum daddy my indian servants is getting them quite ready now that is all right and did you see any other animals i did i saw a black panther creeping round the tool-house and four hyenas in the wood sides a wild boar and a grey ape bab's imagination had always been active but fed by her father's stories and her own recently acquired power of reading to herself it grew much more luxuriantly but teddy's was fading fast swamped by the glorious reality of cricket and the english boy's passion for games besides he was a schoolboy now and was quickly becoming the heartless mindless soulless creature which is generally to be found in preparatory and public schools but he was a healthy happy little fellow notwithstanding and his father rejoiced in his good length bowling and steady batting which after all are so much more suited to schoolboy life and ambition than a thoughtful temperament or a vivid imagination his mother laughed lovingly at his boyish brag and even consented at his earnest request to allow the barber to cut the curling ends off his golden hair so teddy ceased to be a child and became a boy i's been reading to myself said babs and was but a very sad thing what was it darling asked mrs conway babs seized upon any and every book she could find and her parents loved to listen to her literary experiences it was about a very good lady what was a martyr what is a martyr mummy then without waiting for an answer and she was eat by lions in the empty afeter how dreadful exclaimed mrs conway why are you laughing daddy cause it really was quite a solemn sad story do you like sad stories her father asked her hurriedly i like all the stories what was ever written replied babs enthusiastically i don't said teddy cause books are a sort of lessons and lessons are all a fag you like games best my son said his mother smiling rather exclaimed teddy and cricket best of all don't you well since i hurt my hand so much trying to catch that ball of daddy's i am not so fond of cricket for to tell the truth i am frightened of those fast balls which are you most frightened of mummy asked babs whose mind was still in the jungle fast balls or black panthers fast balls just now dear and i am teddy calls me butterfingers but i really can't catch them cause they're so full of hurting that's just like a girl exclaimed teddy scornfully you are such a coward oh teddy i'm not you have to be quite as brave to kill and hunt wild beasts as to catch quick balls but you don't kill wild beasts exclaimed teddy that's only pretending bab stood aghast at this heresy i shouldn't be at all surprised if you has to be eaten by that pack of wolves what i saw in the plantation this morning she said loftily stuff and rubbish answered teddy rudely babs babs called her mother here is a letter for you from uncle charlie oh how splendid but mummy 
i do wish uncle charlie would come here soon stead of writing uncle charlie and me miss each other very bad yes dear i know but neither mrs conway nor any one else knew how much the captain missed his little niece babs left an empty room in the house in onslow square but aunt eleanor soon filled that with smart clothes and new dresses and was glad of the space and babs also left an empty room in uncle charlie's life her room which could not be filled by race-horses or polo ponies or club friends or any of the gaieties of former london seasons a quiet dark room wherein lay a few dusty toys and baby memories yet uncle charlie chose to live in it rather than in the glaring gas-lit atmosphere which was aunt eleanor's native air and as he waited alone in this empty room charlie conway's eyes grew accustomed to the darkness and he saw for the first time in his life as the legacy that babs had unconsciously left him the outline of the ideal end of chapter twelve end of the young pretenders by edith henrietta fowler recorded by celine major